Hello, this is Dr. Tom Groover in Colorado, and I'm on the I'm on the line with Michelle Sanborn from New Hampshire. We're both uh, from the community rights movement. We call it a movement because we've actually actually accomplished some structural change in the form of uh, government uh, and laws which protect uh, local communities, uh, allows them to have to protect that right of local self-government for them to enact laws of their own, local laws which protect their health, safety, and welfare against uh, mainly industrial harms at this point uh, from you know the, the corporate industrial government complex. And uh, so um, we call ourselves a movement because we've created structural change uh, for the betterment of the rights of people, communities, and nature. Uh, welcome, Michelle. Thank you, Tom. How are you doing? I'm good. I, I'm glad to hear from you. I've been following the story there in New Hampshire. Um, for those of you who don't know yet, um, we did a story about this earlier, about a month ago. Uh, the New Hampshire Community Rights Network, uh, which is a network of communities all over New Hampshire, uh, which have these local uh, community bill of rights uh, with prohibitions on harmful corporate state projects. Uh, all these people came together in, at the state capitol uh, and uh, testified or tried to testify in a formal hearing uh, that was put on uh, to uh, hear about the public uh, interest in the New Hampshire Community Rights Amendment. And the New Hampshire Community Rights Amendment is very similar to one that we are now, uh, circ we're circulating the petition for this here in Colorado, uh, hopefully getting it on the state ballot. Our plan is to have it on the ballot in, in 2016. Uh, the amendment gives, uh, it puts in the constitution of the state the right for local communities to write laws to uh, strengthen the rights of individuals, people in nature, uh, so that uh, communities can write laws to protect their health, safety, and welfare. And uh, so this is needed because of something called preemption. And uh, so we talked about that in our previous interview. And uh, what that means is that basically when when communities write these laws, um, the uh, judicial, the the legal doctrine of preemption is structured so that it gives the state uh, and corporations the a trump card, so that they can basically uh, pull this out of their sleeves and say, oh well, this issue is a state of state interest. It has nothing to do with the people who are being impacted the most by these big industrial projects. Uh, you can't ban it, you can't regulate it, it's all up to the state and we've permitted it and it's going to happen and there's nothing you can do about it. So that's basically state preemption in a nutshell. Um, so uh, what I understand is that there were some really interesting shenanigans that went on at the state capitol uh, at the time that the uh, testimony was supposed to happen. and. Uh, Michelle, could you tell us what happened? I just, it's, it, it's really important to understand this. It was, I know that when I spoke with Michelle a little earlier, uh, she was saying it, you know, it was a win, but it was also very discouraging for our, all of us. Uh, and, and we talked about it and then we determined that that discouragement was basically because the uh, corporate state revealed itself in its full glory and um, there's a benefit in that too. So we'll talk about that in a minute. Michelle, can you explain what went on? Yeah, so it was definitely a victory because um, it's the first time that a, a legislature has heard um, an amendment being proposed as far as uh, the right of local community self-government. Um, in New Hampshire, by law, every uh, submitted piece of legislation must have a public hearing. Right. which gives the facade that um, that the public's voice is able to influence uh, government. 
um, what we learned in this process is that it is just that to it is a facade. I mean, can you go in voice? Absolutely. Um, does your voice actually affect the governing decision that's made? Not necessarily and not likely. Um, out of approximately 25 to 30 participants that came to that public hearing, which is a large gathering, it's not uncommon to only have the, the sponsor of a bill and maybe a few uh, additional supporters of that bill. So large group. Um, and out of that group, there were maybe three or four people. There's a sign-in sheet. And so when in the process of signing in, you can say that you support this measure or you oppose this measure and you write who you represent. So do you represent yourself, the public, your community, or are you a lobbyist? And if you're a lobbyist, who do you represent? And so it was interesting to look at that sign-in sheet afterwards. Uh, out of all of the testimonies that were shared, approximately 15 of them came from grassroots communities um, that have either enacted rights-based ordinances in their communities or have uh, supported the constitutional amendment process for the right of local community self-government. And there was one testimony that was given in that committee hearing that was of the nature of dissent, so opposing. It came from a corporate lobbyist and um, basically presented what I would call a whole bunch of smoke screen. So, you know, this is home rule. Uh, this is gonna give communities the authority to just start arbitrarily taxing anything and everything they want at whatever level they want. This is going to affect commerce. This is going to affect business. Um, so a lot of fear mongering, a lot of uh, distraction techniques um, and really a lot of BS. And so um, by the end of, of the time, we, we were allotted 45 minutes um with the number of people that participated obviously that was not going to be significant time to for everyone to have their uh their voice heard and so uh we wound up going over our time and there was pressure from the committee to wrap things up uh, many people had written out their testimonies so that they could read them because it's a very intimidating process it's very much i would not that i've ever been in a court proceeding process uh like to be on the witness stand but that's how i would relate it and that's how i would imagine it it was very intimidating being before and we call it the general court of new hampshire it's like you're before the court and you are testifying uh and it's very it's very intimidating uh they have the right to ask you questions the committee participants uh committee members which are made up of legislators uh you do not have the right to ask them questions so that's how the proceeding goes. Um, and so they really, uh, typically they hold an executive session and they schedule that. Uh, what they decided to do this year is throw in a cute little phrase that gives them the authority to hold an executive session anytime they want, so long as the legislative day has begun. So if there are committee hearings scheduled for that day, let's say starting at nine o'clock in the morning, that from nine o'clock in the morning on for that day, an executive session can be held. Executive sessions are when the committee themselves vote a recommendation that then moves forward to the entire uh, house, which in New Hampshire is made up of 400 representatives. And uh, what they did in our case is, um, it was clear that their minds had been made up before we went in uh there was only one question asked of one committee member out of over an hour of testimony given so they were not interested in learning about it uh they were not interested in engaging we prepared for them committee folders which um, consisted of copious amounts of information all the written testimonies that came from people not only in new hampshire but also ohio we had testimonies that came in from oregon we had testimonies that came in from colorado encouraging the new hampshire legislature to to support this and represent the people and uh, all that was included uh, we also ran a petition uh, which is uncommon in new hampshire we're not an, an initiative state so petitions tend to hold more weight here in the sense that when a petition is run it's showing that um, this is, people felt strongly enough about it to put their name and their information out there to support something of this nature. Um, and all that was presented within their committee folders. Uh, 
I asked them before my testimony if I could present them with their committee folders, letting them know that I would be referencing material within those committee folders and they would be able to reference it along uh, with the testimony. Uh, the chairman said, no, you can hand them in afterwards. So that was another indication that they had no desire to look at or reference the material throughout the process. Um, so uh, the gist of it is that um, at the end of the committee process, um, we went over and as we were exiting the room, we were asked to, to exit quietly. There was another committee hearing that was scheduled uh, that consisted of the one prime sponsor and one individual there to support. So obviously not going to be a lengthy process. We left the room. Uh, it took less than five minutes for them to go through the next hearing. And that individual that sat through that hearing in support of that measure came out of the room a few moments later and said, they just voted to kill your bill. So they did not even have the decency to announce to the interested public that was there, which was an obvious presence, that they were considering holding an executive session that day on that measure, giving us the courtesy to be able to stick around and watch the process. Uh, when they hold an executive session, the public is not um, allowed to engage the committee. The committee can choose to engage the public if they so choose. Uh, but we didn't even have the courtesy. It, it's still a public uh, session. And we didn't even have the courtesy to, uh, to be told that they were going to do so or that they were even considering doing so. Um, so they obviously did not read any material within their, their submitted committee folders. So they made this decision after numerous uh, grassroots testimony supporting the measure, one dissenting testimony opposing the measure by a paid corporate lobbyist. Uh, so they made a recommendation to kill the bill, which goes to the, the House. And on top of that, they held a vote um, to move this to what's called the consent calendar. In New Hampshire, the consent calendar is where they lump a whole bunch of le legislative measures together and they vote on them as one, one vote. Right. No discussion. So whatever is presented in the consent calendar, in our case, it was a unanimous ITL, which is inexpedient to legislate, which means kill the bill. Right. Um, so a unanimous vote to ITL the bill. And when that goes to the House floor during House session, which is scheduled at a different time, uh, they bring forth the consent calendar and they make a motion, uh, do we accept the consent calendar? And that means anything and everything that's in it, that is as it stands. And the whole house votes yay or nay. And so they, in less than maybe 10 minutes, uh, eliminated 46 pages of legislation with one vote. Right, it's like, <clears throat> deleting your trash file on your computer. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I mean, it was, you know, many, many, many months worth of effort um, that was just very quickly and um, uh, very effortlessly on their part, you know, swept right. under the rug. Uh, it was not a conversation that they were comfortable with, obviously, because they weren't interested in engaging us during the public hearing. And it was um, not something that they even wanted to consider or give any validation or merit to right? Um, by even having a discussion about it. Okay, so now, obviously, you got that news that they'd killed your bill, basically. Um, and everyone probably you came to the hearing from all over the state, they're probably still standing around talking, right, when that happened? In the hallway outside? Yeah, we're, yeah, we're in the hallway outside. Yeah, because I've been yeah. to hearings before, too. I, this is exactly what I experience. Okay. Yeah. So um, so they walk out and say, oh, your bill just got killed. And, and it was uh, probably uh, and the initial reaction was one of extreme uh, discouragement and dissatisfaction. Is that Would that be correct? How was that reaction? Uh, I would, yeah. And I would say a lot of um, frustrated... Um, kind of indignant anger, yeah. uh, you know, for people that, I mean, we're taking time out of our day. It's unpaid time. Right. Some people took time off from work. It's their personal time. Right. Um, they, they traveled, some of them, over two hours to get right. down to the Capitol one way. 
So there's, yeah, people had invested of themselves, not just for that public hearing, but these are people that have been invested in their local communities for years, right. fighting projects and enacting these local laws. And this is the next step, you know, with, you mentioned preemption earlier. So this is one of the quickest ways that, that corporations uh, just kind of pull the rug out from underneath communities it, when it comes to challenging these in court is to say, well, New Hampshire is a preemptive state, so therefore, um, you know, this, this, this holds no water whatsoever. You didn't have authority to pass this, this law. Um, and where the reason why they're saying that is that it's that uh, theory or, or concept that has been backed up by the courts to say that the state is the parent, the municipality is the child, and the only thing that the municipality can do is to pass a local law that we have specific permission to pass by the state. Right. Um, as opposed to a home rule would then say a municipality can pass any law so long as the state doesn't prohibit it. And well, that's not the case, and that's not what we were pushing for because that still does not give local governing authority out from under preemption. Right. Um, which is really what, I mean, this amendment is about the right to local self-government, the rights of people, communities, and nature, which is about expanding in, um, and protecting fundamental rights. Uh, I think that really scares them, you know, and we need this at the state level to empower local communities with the authority to enact these laws. We have it, we understand that as an inalienable and inherent right. Uh, but a lot of our elected officials are misguided thinking that um, constitutional rights are somehow subordinate to statutory law. Um, they think that because corporations have succeeded in their claimed rights, which has been uh, secured in case law uh, by the courts, that because it's so, you know, said so, that that makes it so. But when you think back to the times when, uh, you know, abolitionists and, and suffragists, I mean, that was constitutional at that time right. for slaves and women to be considered property with, with no rights whatsoever. That was constitutional then. So just because it's viewed as constitutional perspective today does not make it right, doesn't make it justified, and doesn't make it legitimate at all. Good. Yeah. Thanks for that. Now, um, so obviously it was a big disappointment because here are these communities wanting to encode within the state constitution the right to local community self-government to secure that right and to enforce that right against any potential future you know incursions by the corporate state to basically destroy their communities i mean you have to admit that there are communities around the united states that are kind of being treated like colonies and and uh, you know these industrial processes come in there and spread pollution everywhere and and disrupt the entire community the whole uh, social fabric the the relationships the economics the the beauty everything uh, you know if you look at uh, Flint Michigan as an example you know um, it you know, they lost their right to local community self-government. Uh, they were uh, appointed a, a city manager by the governor. And, uh, you know, the, the water supply had been polluted. Uh, my understanding, it was polluted by uh, the auto industry. So they hooked up, they, they wanted to save money because the community was under a lot of financial distress and they wanted to save money, so they they went for a cheaper water supply, so they took the water uh, routing from the Great Lakes and put it put water from the uh, the river, you know, into their municipal water supply, and it was so corrosive it leached the lead out of the pipes and and severely damaged children and you know the entire population of Flint. Um, yeah. You know, these things are going on more and more now. I mean, you know, I remember years ago when I first began to be really acutely aware of the um, the power corporations have over communities. You know, there was some guy that had a, a chemical storage tank 
at the shore of a river somewhere out, we, out east, and the thing sprung a leak. It leaked like these terrible chemicals into the river. And, you know, you just completely got away with it. There wasn't even really, I don't even remember if there was a slap on the wrist. It's so, interesting you know, that you bring that up because even here in New Hampshire right now, there's, um, there's concerns about the Merrimack River. There's a plastics corporation that is using a chemical that uh, used to be used in Teflon years ago, oh. known to cause cancer. Um, and it's showing up in not only the municipal water supply, it's showing up in private wells. The majority of people in the state of New Hampshire get their water from private wells. Right. We have a lot of significant, uh, you know, significant meaning large watersheds that serve numerous communities. And um, so, yeah, I mean, I, I think that each each state is confronting this at the local level where people are realizing that these kinds of things are permitted by our governments at the state and federal levels. And when a local municipality is interested in protecting the health, safety, and welfare of their residents, they run up against uh, regulations, they run up against preemption, they run up against corporate rights, they run up against these things that in essence put them in a cage uh, and in a cell, if you will, and pro prohibits them from doing what they were elected to do by their representatives at that local level, which is to protect the health, safety, and welfare of those residents. Um, and communities in New Hampshire and others across the nation have said, we, we've had enough. Um, and to be able to uh, have a sponsor for this measure in New Hampshire, that uh, a legislator that would be willing to step out you know, far enough to be able to say, yes, I'm going to stick my neck out and represent the people of New Hampshire and the communities of New Hampshire uh, was, was significant. Um, I think people get focused on the single issues, whether it right. be a pipeline, you know, water contamination, uh, you name it. But all of these various issues have, have had um, success here in New Hampshire with local community bills of rights, right. whether it be like we just had this year town meeting bearing to New Hampshire. Um, passed a water protections community bill of rights to protect all the waterways within their community. Beautiful. In particular, the threat was gravel mining um, that would significantly alter in a, in a contaminating and negative way for not just the people, but the environment, the ice and glass river. Um, so there's uh, everything from waterways, uh, even large groundwater uh, extraction for bottling and selling um, you've got industrial wind, uh, and it's not to say that these communities are against renewable energy. They're against corporations and governments coming in and telling them what is best for where they live. And these are industrial scale projects. Uh, we're also talking about Northern Pass and, and Kinder Morgan pipeline issues. There's, there's a lot of variety of issues here. Right. Uh, free and fair protections, uh, free and fair voting. Um, and we also just had first in the nation community bill of rights passed for protection of um, religious identification and discrimination. Right. So social justice issues, you mm -hmm. know, these people are starting to grasp this and um, and really push it in ways that, that we haven't seen before. It's exciting. Yeah, it's the, it's the revolutionary spirit. <laughs> it's alive. Um, yeah. Well, um, so obviously there was that feeling of disappointment and anger and so on and so forth in, in our democracy school training for the uh, community rights movement. We talk about uh, what we call the regulatory point where it's all of a sudden a judge or an elected official or a, or a committee or in your case, a legislature um, basically says, no, you don't have, we're not interested in this. You don't have this right. We're not going to let you have this legal right. We're not going to help you. Uh, the corporations and their power is far more important to us than, than your health, safety, and welfare. And, Actually, and I'm going in, to interrupt here for a moment because yeah. it went even beyond that, Tom. Oh, really? It went to, in New Hampshire, three-fifths of the House and the Senate have to pass or concur on a constitutional amendment that is proposed before the people 
of New Hampshire even get to vote on it. Yeah. So they're, they're like this filter that gets to decide whether or not we, the people, want to amend our own constitution. Oh, yeah. <laughs> and so that's really what they did was they created a barrier to say, you don't have the right to vote on this. You yeah. don't have the right or you don't get the right or the opportunity to decide this for yourselves. Right. Yeah. So, so I yeah, I mean, and, and a lot of people don't realize that that's really what they're doing is they're they're not even allowing you. Yeah. Um, that that right to vote on it, to have a say. Yes. And, and in effect, it's the same thing happens here in Colorado. I mean, basically, if you want to try and amend the state constitution, you have to get your petition and you know for this your your amendment uh basically has to get through a whole bunch of hearings and usually a supreme court challenge and then it's released and then you can get signatures but you have to get like a hundred thousand valid signatures which means you have to collect a hundred and fifty thousand signatures and the the people who can afford to amend the constitution in this way are usually people with big money, you know? So they pay for people to collect these signatures. In our case, we don't have money. We just have some people and we're going out now and petitioning and, and uh, it seems like it's just an incredible task to amend the constitution. And I think from our perspective, you know, we believe that uh, law is something which is, um, in in process all the should be in process all the time it should reflect the values of the greater good uh, the greater population at all times and i think that what we've seen here is that the the big corporations have basically taken our law from us made it their own you know and our their definition of person uh kind of puts them in a position where they're personhood is much, much more powerful than the collective personhood of everyone in this country. Absolutely. You know, yeah. which is really pretty strange. It's pretty scary. And uh, so, you know, we're up against that. And the system has many checks and balances. And we think that, you know, it's a fair system and it gives checks and balances so that all the various branches of the system will, you know, somehow... Uh, balance each other out and allow for quote justice and legitimate you know practice of government but in reality the whole thing is set up to shut the people out <laughs> and Absolutely. to and to have yeah. this this like a religious faith that these elite corporate board members basically are the ones that are most capable of governing our country and, and putting I'm, glad, that, I'm glad you brought that up because yeah. that's just to say social and um, cultural, it's become cultural, mindset among the people, at least many people that I've encountered. Um, I go out and I speak to communities all across the state of New Hampshire. And it's very common for people to have that mindset that somehow, because in two things, somehow corporations are the experts. Right. Because, because they are looking to come into your community and uh, profit off of a, a resource in your community, somehow, because they've succeeded in doing this in other places, they are an expert. And so when they come into your community, there's a mindset among people that often trust them, believe them, and they're focused on the smokescreen, which is jobs and revenue, um, which is like tossing the dog a bone. Right. You know, and then, um, you know, and then violating them <laughs> when they turn their back. Uh, and so this is, it's a very um, embedded mindset where people have got to come to a place within themselves. And that's part of what this work is about. It's part of uh, what occurred in the process of, of driving this amendment to the state level is the awareness. Um, we call them community rights awareness workshops because right. some people, many people, are still just not aware uh, what this is about. And it's an educational process for communities as well as the legislators. I've had legislators that I have sat down with face to face say to me, I don't believe that the people of New Hampshire are capable of making these decisions for themselves. Right. 
I mean, point blank. And I, you know, you, you just sit there and you want to pick your jaw up off the floor. <laughs> um, and, you know, and I, I looked at this individual and I said, um, you are a member of your community, are you not? You were elected by your community to represent your community. You're one of your community. I mean, the, it, really, do they stop to think about what they're really saying? If, if they don't feel that the community is capable of making these decisions on behalf of their community, what gives them the audacity to think that somehow they're better than everybody else in their community and simply because they were elected, they know better. And these representatives are often bought and paid for by corporate lobbyists. Uh, it was very difficult to, to get sit down face-to-face -face time with representatives um whereas you know corporate paid lobbyists often have you know backroom closed door meetings that, that can go on for an hour uh, we, we were lucky if we got 15 20 minutes 30 minutes with some of them and there's 400 representatives house representatives to reach out to uh, an additional 24 senators in new hampshire that's that's a lot uh you know, not as much as gathering hundreds of thousands of signatures, uh, for sure, but it's it's a challenge, it's a feat. And before you can accomplish that, you have to break through the cultural and social mindsets that keep people uh, in that cage of freedom. It's we're, we're free within the limits of the boundaries set upon us. Who sets those boundaries upon us? The corporations do, our governments do, whether it's state or, or federal levels. Um, they're using corporate rights, they're using preemption, they're using uh, the fact that uh, what they call, well, I'll just call it property rights because that's what everybody else calls it, or they don't recognize nature as having rights. Everything is focused on, oh my goodness, don't take my, my property rights away from me. It's not a matter of taking them away from you, it's a matter of expanding those property rights to protect the whole community not just your individual property rights, right. but the collective property rights. That doesn't exist right now. No. You know, so these are things that, uh, that keep people within that cage of freedom. And so long as you operate within that cage of freedom, you don't realize that you're in a cage. You think well, no. you're free. Well, I mean, what you need to realize is that the entire media, corporate media is set up to uh, deflect your attention away from the cage. Mm -hmm. So we don't know we're in that cage because everything we read, everything we hear uh, is, you know, telling us that we are living the in, in America, we're living the American dream, uh, that we're practicing democracy and, and we, we enjoy freedom. And that mm -hmm. these are the values that we export to foreign countries when we you know, basically produce regime change through covert op operations, you know. So we, we really have uh, this faith, this belief in a system that's entrenched within us from our early childhood, probably from the moment of our birth, because that's the way the whole system has been set up over the last I don't know. We say 200 years, but I mean, before that, uh... <laughs> it, it was brought across the ocean. <laughs> it was brought I mean, across the ocean for it sure. Was brought across the ocean. We have implemented uh, the, the same, the same government that existed in England. Yeah. You know, I mean, there, there are some differences that they're minor. Um, Pretty minor. But, yeah. You yeah. Know, that's it. We, yeah. we brought the same um, kind of government that represents the, the wealthy elite minority and protects their interests and um, violates the rights of everybody else, which is the majority people you and like you and me. Right. Um, <laughs> there's power in the people. There's power in majority. People have uh, lost sight of that. And that's really what triggered the whole American Revolution in the first place was uh, the infringement and the stripping away of their local right of community self-government. Um, and here we are again, you know, we're, we're watching history repeat itself. Uh, and, you know, uh, community rights movement is a uh, second revolution. Well, it sounds like 
the the people of New Hampshire are starting to realize that this was a huge victory, this whole experience. Mm -hmm. um, and can we go through some of the really early wins with this whole campaign? Because I read uh, some quotes from uh, the, you, you were able to actually acquire a, a sponsor in the legislature to champion the New Hampshire Community Rights State Constitutional Amendment. And uh, could you talk about this representative and what she, what, what she said about it? I know there were a couple of really excellent quotes that kind of made my jaw drop open. Yeah. Um, so, and it's interesting because um, she's a great person. Uh, her name is Representative Susan Emerson, and she represents uh, Cheshire County District 11, uh, which would be the community of Ringe. And Ringe happens to be one of the, uh, I believe, out of 17 communities um, that will be affected by the proposed Kinder Morgan Northeast Energy Direct Pipeline, uh, should that you know gain gain approval. And um, so this, this was an eye opener uh, for her. Uh, she's been very opposed. There's a number of legislators that, that have been opposed to the numerous projects uh, across New Hampshire. And so Representative Emerson was our prime sponsor. And we were able to also uh, get bipartisan support from uh, Representative Suzanne Smith, uh, Mary Cooney, uh, Wayne Burton, and Stephen Darrow, as well as um, Senator uh, sponsorship from Jeannie Forrester. Um, so we had Republicans, Democrats from the what we call the North Country, the northern part of New Hampshire, as well as the, the southern uh, New Hampshire community. So uh, great representation. And I'll read a quote, um, if I can uh, quickly locate it here. Oh, of course, when I'm looking for it, then I'm not seeing it. My apologies. It's worth okay, the wait. So, yeah, they're good quotes. Um, she, she's a, like I said, she's a remarkable woman. So uh, this was in one of the press releases put out by New Hampshire Community Rights Network. And Representative Susan Emerson stated, it seems beyond imagination that any member of this distinguished body would support habits of governance that would be destructive to the unalienable rights of the people or deny their authority to engage democratically for the protection of their rights. This was at the point where um, we had uh, held the uh, the public hearing, and were we were in the process of learning what had occurred, right. um, and kind of verifying and, and validating the information. Um, and that was her response to that. Um, once we had kind of validated and confirmed some of the shenanigans that, that had gone on, which technically were not in violation of any regulations, um, she responded by saying, I am disappointed that more of my colleagues did not understand the purpose of this amendment, which is to provide new guards against the oppression of the people unwittingly or wittingly by a central government and to secure their right to chart their own course where their fundamental rights are at issue for the security of their own communities, their homes, their families, and future generations. Clearly, there is more that we, as elected representatives of the people of New Hampshire, could be doing to protect them. Amazing. Um, yeah. Uh, she's just, she's a very um, spunky person and a uh, lot of energy, a lot of vim, and a lot of vigor. And she's known for uh, definitely going with her, her conscience, with her uh, commitment to the people. Um, one thing that was really impressive to me is that uh, she she worked on this and was very committed and dedicated to this the whole time um, she was actually out on medical leave. Yeah. And so she made a significant effort with this whole entire process, um, not even being able to access her colleagues directly. Um, she made every effort to, uh, you know, give provide quotes, to participate in the process. Um, and she even took her written testimony that was submitted during the public hearing. It was read by one of the co-sponsors because she was not able, Representative Emerson was not able to be there in person. So um, Representative Suzanne Smith 
was willing to read that testimony on her behalf. Um, it has to be introduced, otherwise it um, gets tabled. So right. um, we had a group of sponsors that were willing to make this happen and at least have the opportunity for the public to, uh, to voice um, their support for it. And so she took her testimony and she submitted it as an open letter uh, to the papers. So that was published in the Monadnock Ledger transcript on uh, February 25th, and it's titled, Let's Give Power Back to the People. So anyone who's interested, uh, that can be looked up online. Uh, the website is www.ledger, L-E-D-G-E-R, transcript, T-R-A-N-S-C-R-I-P-T, dot com. And if you do a search, they have a little search bar. You could just search Representative Susan Emerson. Yeah, I'll um, tell you what, if you can give me that link, I'll put it, you know, in the information contained in this video. I'll put it on the screen or I'll put it in the notes, uh, you know, that you see down below the the YouTube video. So, That's yeah, great. yeah, I would like to read that myself. And uh, uh, so... I don't know. This is my perception of the thing. It sounds to me like you've got some pretty um, revolutionary language there, <laughs> you know, and uh, yeah. it, it seems to me like that language uh, forms the foundation for future campaigns. I Absolutely. mean, even if you were to resubmit this using that language and tell the story of how this went on this time and... Um, you know, probably uh, the same thing will happen. <laughs> I would not be surprised. <laughs> it, it might even be worse the next time, you know. But uh, it, it seems to me like if more and more people become aware of the way uh, they're, them as individuals and they as individuals and their communities and their natural environment are being treated uh, and the, the regard for these things... Uh, uh, for simply uh, private property and resource extraction rather than uh, uh, having any rights in and of itself, of their self. Um, you know, I think that's going to start a conversation. I think that's pretty much the, the big win here is that this conversation has gotten started at the level of the state legislature. And um, I just think it's amazing. And I I applaud your success with this. I think you've, you know, your organization, you and your organization, all the local people in all these towns and cities around New Hampshire have accomplished something magnificent. And uh, it's, we'll, it's we'll been start. a while in the making for sure, you know, and that's that's what a movement is about. It's not something that that just uh, flips a switch and shows up overnight. Right. You know, these are oppressions that that have been coming against the people of New Hampshire for for. I mean, in particular, as far as structuring under the New Hampshire Community Rights Network um, over the last decade. But as we've been speaking, I mean, it's this has been since the foundation of our nation. This right. is nothing new. Um, it's it's just it's a a more recent uh, you know action on that same threat to our our local community self government, and and really it's which means a threat to our inalienable an inherent right to politically, civic, uh, and collectively, you know, decide what happens where we live. To have that governing authority recognized at the state level is really what it's about. And, um, you know, you're right. It's, it's, it is a great accomplishment. And sometimes in the face of that frustration and discouragement, it's easy to lose sight of that. <laughs> um, but, you know, yeah, it, it is exciting. And it wouldn't have happened without the, the communities. Um, and, you know, and all of the uh, sad stories that, that go along with that as well. You know, all the harm that, that has occurred, uh, that has inspired and moved people to take action. Well, thank you, Michelle. I just appreciate this so much. And, uh, and w with your permission, we'll be checking in again on you soon to see how the story evolves. Absolutely. I appreciate the opportunity. Michelle, uh, could you share with everyone the action steps that they could take to become more informed and become more involved in this movement there in New Hampshire? Absolutely. 
Um, they can access the New Hampshire Community Rights Network website, which is www.nhcommunityrights.org. Uh, they can also email at info at nhcommunityrights.org. Um, and what we've been doing is mounting a uh, community rights awareness workshop campaign. So any community that is interested in um, learning about who decides what happens within their community, uh, can that be changed? How can it be changed? Uh, if you're wondering about why corporations have more power than local communities, um, how is it and why is it that state governments uh, can permit corporations to cause harm? Um, let's see, how is it that governments um, can prevent communities from local lawmaking decisions, you know, even uh, against the best interests of the community? I mean, any of these kinds of questions, why is it that communities are stuck in this place where it seems like these projects are going to be done unto them and there's nothing that can be uh, done to stop it? Right. Any, any questions? Um, those are some of the things that we address in the Community Rights Awareness Workshop. Right. And um, you can email us, uh, contact us, and um, you know we can talk to you more about it, and you can host one in your community. 